Heidi Kreitschett will be presenting next. Heidi's expertise in multi-day wood firings, idea research and development, and her boldly playful, fluid, and direct handling of clay are what excite me about her work. And Amanda Gentry will pre uh, present third. And Amanda's conceptual approach to her work, her ability to articulate and explore language, her pursuit of large scale works, such as public works while maintaining the intimacy of the work were things that are exciting to me about Amanda's work. So, Joey. I can see where the lights are. Hey everyone, my name is Zoe Powell and I'm a ceramic artist um, specializing in using locally sourced clays, sands, and other aggregate materials in my work. My studio is currently based in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I've lived for the past five years. As you'll notice throughout my presentation tonight, the majority of my work is now fired in an electric kiln, uh, but I began my career firing predominantly wood kilns. Um, very much like the one that Cynthia designed that we'll be firing later on in this residency. I'm eager to have the opportunity uh, to wood fire again. It's not an opportunity that comes around very frequently for me. Um, and it's, I'm so excited to have a team of such wonderful and talented artists work alongside. Before I begin talking about my work, I wanted to start by saying that I've always wanted to be an artist, but I didn't always um, trust myself to take on such a volatile career. In fact, when I was in school, I studied both sculptural art and biology uh, with the intention of using my biology degree for a potential fallback career. And that decision led me to have a much heavier course load while I was in school, but I think it was well worth it. Uh, so these first few slides are really just meant to visually demonstrate how I integrate inspiration from biology and other bio biologic forms um, into my ceramic work. But now working as an artist and planning for my future, I don't really foresee myself using my biology, uh, biology degree in any official sense but I am grateful to have been exposed to such a diverse field during my formative years. To this day, I think back on some of my old classes for inspiration and occasionally even review notes and ideas when I'm planning a new piece in the studio. I really value the sciences and I find great beauty in what they categorize and explain, but I'm an artist at heart. Nowadays, I work predominantly in sculptural vessels uh, produced from clays that I harvest and process myself. My work with local clays is primarily an exercise in sustainability um, and taking full responsibility for a material and honoring it throughout the production process. This is also the principal reason why I leave my work unglazed. I really prefer to leave the raw clay exposed to really highlight its inherent beauty. I've always been drawn to form over function and have long preferred creating sculpture over producing utilitarian wares or pottery. In creating sculptural art, I find a great burden is lifted from me and I have total freedom to explore form for the sake of form without necessarily needing to worry about the inconveniences of something's weight, its balance, or even its durability. However, that being said, I do have a series of smaller works that straddle the line between sculpture and utility. There are certain forms within the range of functional wear that I find very compelling, particularly when I can distort them and make them more my own. I have several, several signatures that I weave into my differing bodies of work in order to encourage a more coherent feeling between them. So for example, all my work, whether it's large or small, rests on a rounded edge like this one here. I find that this adds visual levity to a piece and creates interesting effects with balance and shadow. I also take great care in beveling all the edges of my work and of course, polishing the surface smooth to achieve that really soft inviting finish. I try to think of these smaller pieces as opportunities to explore composition on a more uh, miniature efficient scale. 
like a maquette or a study for one of my larger pieces. No matter the size, I'm attracted to open vessels for what they represent. To me, they've always acted as metaphors for discarded shells or casings, devoid of whatever they were originally evolved to protect. I see them as objects of comfort, and I believe that they can help assuage the constant feelings of vulnerability that we experience as conscious beings. The largest ones in particular seem to reference a sort of shelter due to their human size capacity. Like I mentioned earlier, I have a personal fascination with biological morphology. Many of the forms that I take inspiration from, things like wombs, cocoons, or seed pods, are directly related to genesis, protection, and development. However, it recently occurred to me that these biologic structures are also related to transformation and metamorphosis. So I've amended my view of these empty vessels to be as transitional spaces for whatever occupied them previously. They provide com comforting space um, that brings about positive change. Whenever I begin a large piece, I usually begin by drawing some quick sketches. And without intending to, I almost always draw the piece as how it will be seen from above first. Uh, for these more complex forms with multiple lobes, uh, these sketches are very helpful for me to get a generalized sense of the movement of the piece before it is built. But my initial sketches are really just guidelines, and I don't always uh, stay true to them throughout the making process. My building process is very free and intuitive, so each piece naturally undergoes quite a lot of change. I build these first pieces or I build these pieces by first constructing all of the individual lobes. Um, some of them are coil built and then scraped smooth and others are just very thin slabs that have been either hand curved or draped over a generic mold. Once all the components have stiffened up to a leather hard consistency, I assemble them based on what curves feel right together. Sometimes the individual components are cut down to help the curves match, but I try to use the pieces as is whenever possible. So it's like working with tangrams, but in three dimensions. Because of this intuitive building method, I can usually build these without stopping to make conscious design decisions every few minutes. Instead, my mind is free to wander and consider other topics like conversations or interactions that I've had with other people. My process is very meditative and ruminative in this way. I build a unique connection with each piece depending on my current emotional state at the time of building it. And I, I think of each piece as very much an extension of myself. One of the elements I find most intriguing about my work is the exposed structure that acts as a skeleton or a framework for the sculpture. I'm interested in both the formation of the structure and how it is ultimately revealed to the viewer. So here, uh, the aperture of this form is relatively narrow and closed off. It forces much of the interior to be in shadow, but I embrace the mystery that this lends the piece. On starting this residency here in Homer, I wasn't quite sure how my work would change. I knew that what I, I wanted whatever I made here to be unique and subtly different from my usual work, but it took me a few days to settle into the new studio routine and to establish a theme. During that time, I worked with familiar forms that I knew would hold up well to a variety of wood-fired surfaces. Forms like these large, very simple bowl shapes. Uh, before I talk about how I inevitably decided to differentiate these pieces from other bowls that I've made previously, I should mention here that clay work was not my only intention for this residency. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about family and how physical distance has caused some emotional distance and separation between my mother and my sister and me. We've always been very close, but since the pandemic started, uh, both of them had to restart their lives in different parts of the country. And this has made connecting with one another more difficult than ever before. So as a token of strengthening, uh, strengthening the physical bond between us, I decided to make a lap quilt for each of them. I think that there is something so deeply personal and intimate about a lap quilt. It is not intended to cover a bed or to provide warmth to two people. 
It is something designed specifically to provide comfort to just one person. It's a quilt to hold and nurture them when I can't always be with them. I brought the first of these quilts with me here to work on in the evenings before I go to sleep. It's my mother's quilt. I love the tightly puckered surface it has developed so far. It's so different from my polished and scraped ceramic pieces. But after spending so much time with it, I decided it's a surface I would like to incorporate in my wood-fired bowls. I was inspired on how to accomplish this new surface after finding Cynthia's collection of antique glass floats hidden around her home. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these floats, but they are a new marvel for me. They're Japanese floats that were used in the early 20th century to aid in the suspension of fishing nets. Each one was secured to its net with an intricate pattern of knots. Sometimes the floats would break free from their captivity and drift out on the open sea, often for years or decades. Occasionally, the globes wash up on Pacific beaches, lightly frosted from years of tumbling in salt and sand. I love how the netting that was originally wrapped around the float acts as a resist to protect the surface from sand abrasion. The concept of a partial resist translates very well to wood firing. My plan for these large bowls is to mix a thick wadding slip, which I'll explain in a second, uh, to brush a stitched pattern on their surface. The image on the left shows a test that a friend of mine made this summer, uh, demonstrating a slightly different technique, but it has a very similar end result. It's a linear network of lines moving across the form. Wadding is a material used in wood firings that acts as a buffer between the work and the shelves on which the work is placed. It is a very high melting point and therefore does not fuse to the work, even in the extreme temperatures of the kiln. Instead, it leaves expressive marks on the surface, recording the movement of the flame on each piece. It acts as a resist just like the netting of the glass floats and is a unique way of mark making. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to experiment with this applied surface pattern, something that I don't think I necessarily would have done in my own studio. So in these two photos, the red spots on the glossy bowl are where um, wadding was placed. And then on the black bowl, it's that beige kind of um, abstract shape. I feel that this residency is really encouraging me to live my life more deeply. I'm having deeper conversations, deeper relationships, deeper meaning to my work, and I have a deeper understanding of myself. So thank you, Cynthia, for inviting me to join you, Heidi and Amanda, these six weeks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, thank you, Benel. Thank you, Asia. Um, Cynthia, thank you, of course. And Taro, you're here. Thank you for uh, allowing us to be in your home for six weeks. <laughs> it's been um, such a wonderful experience. We're three weeks in. Um, my name is Heidi. I'm originally from Philadelphia. And I've spent most of my adulthood on the west side of the US, so Colorado and over, and uh, more recently have moved back to the Philadelphia area, probably after being away for close to 35 years. Um, so I have really enjoyed the difference between um, being on the East Coast growing up and um, really becoming uh, an adult on the West Coast and um, meeting so many people and having so many experiences that have truly affected uh, the growth of my artwork as an adult. Um, so this is an image here, one of the first images that we saw coming in um, to Homer. This is turn again arm. And so right off the bat, we were thrown into this beautiful scenery, something I've never seen before. 
there's a part of Alaska that reminds me a lot of living in Colorado. So occasionally I'll be walking around or hiking and for a split moment, I'll think, God, I could really be in Colorado or Montana right now. So I've really enjoyed feeling the connection of the similarities um, of where I've lived and then seeing um, Alaska. But there's nothing like this. This is amazing. Um, so I have um, uh, gone through school. I've gotten my BFA and my MFA um, on the West Coast uh, in fine arts. Um, I've focused on wood-fired ceramics for 25 years now. Um, and that's my passion. I absolutely love wood firing. Um, I love the surface. I love what it does to the clay. Um, I find that um, the wood fired results keep me engaged every time. So for me, wood firing my work is kind of the only way to finish it. Oh, the other computer? Okay. What do I hit here? Is there? Okay, perfect. So how do I have to do it here too? Okay, got it. So the beginning of this residency, I spent probably the first week, maybe five days, but definitely the first week just trying to settle in and find my connection to what I was trying to discover by doing this and being here. Um, so countless walks, some hikes, um, taking images, detailed shots, really trying to dive into the surroundings and finding what would inspire me. I, I knew I didn't wanna be making work that I had done before. I really wanted to use this opportunity to investigate myself, my personal growth, um, especially from uh, mid 2020 and throughout this year of 2021, I felt like I had a lot of growth that I needed to um, find a voice for through my art. Um, so really kind of taking that time to investigate and research and uh, look and see um, has been so incredible for me. I've thoroughly enjoyed just the first week of this residency. This is um, out at Mud Bay. So I'm really interested in textures and um, softnesses and hardnesses and lines and curves. I'm, I'm fascinated by that. And I do try to put that into my artwork because of the clay and the wood fire. I do love all those types of textures that you can get from the wood kiln. So I'm really drawn to this photo because of that, the textures from the rock, the grasses, the softness of the water, the sunset. I just find so much about that area at Mud Bay to resemble what I see in my wood-fired work. This was another day we went to Ketchumac Bay. This, this was actually the first day after we flew in. So we were able to go and walk around and stretch our legs from the whole day of traveling. And again, I, I love the, the hardness and the softness of the beach, the waves crashing, all of this environment. And these were some of the first pieces of inspiration that I found were some rocks. And that little golden nugget in the middle is a piece of clay brick, I think, right? Um, that people I think draw with is what I understand. Um, but I love, I could spend the whole day walking on the beach, walking on the coast. It's so much fun and all the treasures that you find. So I get a lot of inspiration um, just from doing day trips like this and finding things that are out in nature.
again, some images of uh, details of inspiration from nature, walking around. Um, the colors are so beautiful. Um, again, the, the hardness, the lines, the softness, these are all things that are super important to me um, to incorporate into my art. Um, so besides doing clay work, I, I also am a painter. And when I see images like these, especially the rock on the top right corner, um, that makes me want to paint. I get so inspired by these kinds of images. They're so important for my journaling and just for my own, um, you know, memories of inspiration from where I'm at. So these at some point when I get back to my studio, these will somehow come into future paintings, which I'm really looking forward to seeing what I create with, um, with acrylics and canvas. And so <clears throat> I think it was on the same trip to Ketchumick Bay that we did drive past Bunnell and um, Jared's installation was um, really exciting for me because I felt like this idea of the buoy and the forms would be something that I could incorporate into why I was here and I felt like I found some kind of connection with something I could create out of clay that would be a simple form, but yet also be a metaphor to what I had been struggling with in 2020 and then through this year. Um, so I really enjoy this installation that you have out here. I know it's been up since 2015, so probably you all are, you've seen it a lot, I'm sure. but. For someone who hasn't seen anything like that, that really mm. struck me to be pretty powerful. So I started to do some research um, on buoys. We went to the Pratt Museum and I was really drawn mm. to this fishing buoy that's on the left-hand side. And of course, drawn to the glass buoys that have the netting and um, I, there's something about this worn look that I'm drawn to. And again, I love the forms. They're simple, they're, they're round and simple, similar to those rocks that I found on the beach. But I really do love this worn look. Um, I love the lettering. And so I've just found this relationship with buoys and I, I've been just keep, you know, I keep looking at them and I'm researching them and I'm trying to get more images of them. Um, this is a painting of mine on the left hand side. And when I saw this image of those buoys, I immediately thought of this painting and it really just connected with me how I would like to put that type of a surface into my clay work. Um, and to have that worn textured look is something that I enjoy doing when I paint. So this is a three foot by three foot painting, acrylics, um, lots of layers of paint. And what I'll do is I'll let the paint dry and then I'll come back in and scrub it. So it'll start to peel off and you'll see the different colors of paint beneath it. So, um, if you look at the top part, that pinkish red, there's some uh, like scratching and scribble in there. And that's a message that I've put into the painting. Um, and with the buoys, when you look at some of the buoys, there's numbers and there's um, text on them. And so again, this connection between what I was doing with my paintings and with the buoys, I found that to be something that I really wanted to push a little bit more in my work, my clay work, especially. So here's, <clears throat> this is a four by four acrylic painting. And again, 
I saw this image of buoys and it reminded me of this painting. So I, I just felt like I, you know, again, I wanted to come and make something that was different for me out of clay. And so I felt this connection with the buoys. And so that was what I have been kind of pushed to create. So the idea that I'm working on is creating buoys that um, are not a typical buoy, but they're going to be my own buoys that I'm making and they'll represent self, they'll represent my relationships with people. And I'm gonna try to incorporate um, numbers and text on the buoys that symbolize either that period of time or if it's symbolic to uh, a death or a birth or an anniversary or something like this. This is another painting that again, I felt like was um, you know, just what I've been seeing out on Cynthia's property and how it connects for me to my, my work is, um, I, I just really am drawn to that. I'm really excited about that. So as I'm researching these buoys, I'm looking at netting. I'm looking at the beautiful um, rope knots that people do and the clamps and how they're hung. I'm thinking about with these images, what I love is to be able to do an installation of ceramic buoys and possibly hanging them in this type of display. So um, this is looking into one of the clay buoys. This is, um, uh, it's called the extended pinch method and it's basically um, a hand building technique where you're pinching the clay and you go around and around and around with these little clay cookies and you get these beautiful patterns. So this is looking into the clay buoy. There's no bottom. I'm hoping that in the wood fire, I'll get some cracking. Typically you would do an infrastructure to make it really solid and strong. I've left that out because I'm hoping that I get some of them that might um, like taco or collapse a little bit or crack. So I get some of that worn look along with that wood fired surface that looks like it's been pulled up from the sea, you know. And one of the things again that I love about this technique is the texture. So you can see you can leave the clay surface with that feathered look or a scaled look, or you can come in and you can smooth that all down on the outside surface and you can get those beautiful, they're almost like a pock mark or something. You can get those beautiful marks. And that's nice too, because you'll get the ash to land in those little spaces and settle in there or melt out. It's a very strong technique. You can build quick, um, you can build large, and the clay, you can see how thin the clay is. So these are light, they're not heavy to lift and move, which makes it really nice when you're, if you're working by yourself or if you're in your own studio, it's a great technique to go big. Um, and I'm, these aren't finished. They're still, I'm still pinching the clay up and around as I'm working. <clears throat> And I'm thinking about dorsal fins at this point. I'm thinking about um, whale tails. I'm just thinking more nautical, nautically, nautical. And um, uh, the one on the left side is complete. The one that looks like a dinosaur in the middle, that one's finished as well. 
So these are upside down. So if you imagine them turned upright, that's they'll be hanging that way. Um, and I'm hoping that I can either make a clay or wooden cap for the bottom. So when they're upside down, they'll have this nice wooden or clay cap, which is where the the rope or the nylon or whatever the material is that will make them hang will come through. So you won't be able to look inside of them. They'll be capped off. <clears throat> These are close ups of uh, smaller buoys that I am working on as well. And you can see I'm scratching into the surface. I'm trying to do what I did with the paintings onto the clay sculpture. So scraping away, scratching into, putting on some numbers and some text to make them more significant to um, periods of my life that I want to express. Um, again, some more surface. Uh, the image on the left is um, just a cap for a pen that I've pushed through into the clay <clears throat> and it made these beautiful little bumps um, and the same with the one on the right hand side it's just a bigger cap from from like a water bottle or something like that and I just took the cap and I pushed it through and I got these nice round um, textures and patterns that came through The idea um, that I hope is successful with this project is that I'll be able, after the firing, I'll be able to group buoys together and hang them, and that will be the piece. So either a pair of buoys or three buoys. Um, when we go to load the kiln, I'm hoping that I can um, when we, when we load, there are areas of the kiln that get just hammered with ash. And the work when you pull it out gets really, um, it's real chunky. There's a surface to the wood-fired work that um, I am so drawn to. I love that. So I'm hoping that as we load, I'll be able to have some pieces that are fused together. So they kind of come out like a chunk and possibly then can hang as one symbolic piece to a significant, again, a significant um, moment for me in my life. And then this is why I wood fire. Mm -hmm. I love wood firing. And this is why I do it because each of these women are going to throw wood into a kiln <laughs> and everyone here is a part of that surface. So I make my work but I put the work into a kiln and there are always different kilns that I fire in and the crew is different and the wood is different, the soil, the water, everything that the tree has soaked up at every different location where I've fired, it's always different. And that's why I love to wood fire because these lovely ladies will be putting that finish on my work. So I love that. <laughs> So thank you. <laughs> hmm. <clears throat> my fellow artists will tell you that my threshold her tears is rather low. <clears throat> so if ginseng were achievable, then I hope by stating this up front, I might avoid crying for your sakes during my portion of this presentation. <clears throat> uh, first off, I'd like to thank all of those who came here to listen to us tonight. The artist talk is dreaded by most artists. We spend the majority of our time 
speaking through form, line, or color. In our studios, day to day, we rarely need use of words. Without the artist's talk, we could go a lifetime without articulating about the work of our hands. This external prompt, the artist's talk, forces us to stop, to dig, to ruminate, to go deeper. And for that, I thank you and the generosity of the Bunnell Street Arts Center. And my deepest gratitude to our colleague, Cynthia, who has shown an uncommon generosity in opening not only her studio and her home, but her heart to us as well. I know I can speak for all three of us in saying that this space that you have created and shared has hosted growth both professionally and personally um, that is immeasurable. So I'd like to start off with a quote from a song by Everything But The Girl called I Don't Understand Anything. This feeling that life's incomplete, do you feel that too? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> do you know what I mean? And if I should start to cry and I can't begin to tell you why. And I stumble when I begin. It's because I don't understand anything. At the crux of any practice lies the question, why? Why do I do what I do? Why do I make? And why do I make what I make? I make to soothe the ache inherent to what some call the human condition or this feeling that life's incomplete. While it is not isolated to being in the studio, I do find that the moments when I capture glimpses of completion or wholeness or connection to something greater is when I am in flow in the studio. Play, for me, is a sanctuary of sorts. It holds me as I hold it. It is a channel that puts me in dialogue with the numinous. The works that I make are invitations to others to share in the transcendent experiences afforded me through my clay. My first offering of this came through the use of movement. Many of my forms do not lay, fat, lay flat. Instead, they have curves that yearn to rock if gently nudged. I'm sure many of us experienced being soothed in a rocker before we even had the use of language to speak. Even now, rocking in a rocking chair has a way of melting away troubles and the time that so easily manufactures them. In addition to movement, I soothe this ache through creating a surface that brings comfort through the sense of touch, often surprising the viewer, or in this case, the toucher with a sudden loss of inhibition as they find themselves hypnotically caressing a form. Most of the work that I shared in the movement section had been fired in wood-fired kilns Back home in Chicago, I am at the mercy of the invitation of a potter friend in Wisconsin whose anagama kiln is a little over five times the size of what we will be firing out at Cynthia's this coming week. As such, it is rarely fired. Um, this has led me into a relationship with terracotta, 
which lends itself to the fine sanding that arrests inhibition. Uh, sometimes I like to introduce aggregates that will not only leave its mark on the surface as a scrape and refine a form, but will oftentimes tell a story of place or origin. This piece was made with North Carolina blue slate while I was in residency in North Carolina. And this piece includes uh, fine pebbles from uh, Rainbow Beach on the south side of Chicago. This piece was made with the cremains of a friend's father. And again, this is another piece that includes the North Carolina blue slate while I was in residency there. A third component I like to explore that takes the edge off this human condition is that of sound. I began to notice that the cavities within the forms I was making would reverberate with the sound of my voice when I would speak into them. This drove me to want to explore the interior sound on a large scale. And so I proposed building a human scaled dome, which ultimately led me to Starworks in North Carolina for a two and a half month residency. The piece I'm building here, Born Again, took every minute of the two and a half months I was there and a pound or two less than 6,000 pounds of clay. <clears throat> Born Again measures nine feet in diameter and about six feet in height. The opening is approximately 24 inches tall at its highest point, so that in order to fully experience it, one must get on their belly to crawl in. Once inside, the acoustics are so sharp that even the sound of one's breath reverberates, leaving one with the feeling of being held in the womb. What I had wanted to achieve with Born Again was an experience so transcendent that when someone had crawled out of the form, they were left with a feeling of having been born again. While I was in residency there, I received an opportunity for a solo exhibit out in California and wanted to share the profound experience of personal reverberation that I had just created, yet on a smaller scale that could be made in my studio, fired, and then shipped. This led to murmuration. Murmuration is 12 pieces made with terracotta and the inclusion of crushed Chicago common brick with gilded interiors of 23 karat gold. Unfortunately, the COVID hit a week and a half into the exhibit and cut it short. And to be honest, I am not sure when the world will be ready to experience murmuration as I have intended it to be experienced. Why I'm here. And so this brings me, finally brings me to why I'm here. Aside from the honor of having been asked to join this cohort, this incredibly, incredibly talented cohort. Um, earlier this year, I lost one of the best things that ever happened to me. This is Hafiz, Swiffer, Cloud, Pistol, Popcorn, Pants, Mix, Squeeze, Madood. <laughs> My love for Hafiz was bigger than I could ever have imagined loving anyone. To start in on the long journey of processing this profound grief, I went into my sanctuary, my studio, where I made wake, 
Wake is approximately seven feet in diameter with its highest point measuring a little less than 30 inches. Wake references not only the period after a person's death, but the disruption of a peaceful surface after a massive presence has passed. In my case, it references waking every morning, and not finding Hafiz in my arms. The silver lining of this dark fluffy cloud for me was finding out just how loved and supported I am, even though it had been present and available to me prior, I had been unable to see it. However, my loss was so great that I could not contain it. And people gathered around. They gathered around me. They held me. I came to Homer just a few weeks after pulling Wake out of the kiln, wanting to make work that spoke to this concept of being held or holding space for another. This piece I call holding space, it consists of 10 units that will ultimately come together to form a circle. Uh, these six have been bisqued. We have four that are drying as greenware right now. Segments will be fired in pairs with the intention to hold between them the work of my cohorts as others have held space for me this past year, I will hold space for others in the kiln. In doing so, the impression that is made from their work onto mine and vice versa will inform the path of travel of the flame and will be recorded on the surface of the work. Building this work and firing it in this way reinforces the beauty that has been revealed to me by the community that is gathered around me to hold me as I grieve. There's no getting around it. At the core of my work is the most basic of forms, the circle. In my search for completion, no other shape could act as a better guide. Recently, an artist neighbor of mine in my studio building popped her head into my studio and said in a rather benign way, wow, everything is round in here. I'm glad that the point was not lost on Iris. <laughs> I'd like to close with a poem by Hafiz's namesake that couldn't state better the poignancy of a circle. Circles, the moon is most happy when it is full and the sun always looks like a perfectly minted gold coin that was just polished and placed in flight by God's playful kiss. And so many varieties of fruit hang plump and round from branches that seem like a sculptor's hand. I see the beautiful curve of a pregnant belly shaped by a soul within and the earth itself and the planets and the spheres, I've gotten the hint. There is something about circles the beloved likes, Hafiz. Within the circle of a perfect one, There is an infinite community of light. Thank you.
I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about of what I have started working on as I entered this residency with these three women. <coughs> My three-year-old self innately recognized that in my maternal grandmother, there was strength shared through tenderness. She and my mother were part of my young life for far too short a time. And over the past year, I've been consciously exploring my maternal lineage and how it impacts the marks I make in my work. I've long resisted softness as a virtue because in my gut understanding of our volatile patriarchy, gentleness was a protective skill of going quietly unnoticed rather than an indicator of vitality and strength. By asking questions such as, how do I reconcile caregiving as a feminist? And what does that tender care look like in my work? I'm examining my own preconceptions. For this residency, I began by visually constructing the place in my body where emotions reside in me. That correlates to the re relationships in my torso between my pelvis and rib cage. This floating zone contains my heart and also the soft center of my gut near my belly button. It's my sensory core. It expands as I breathe and rigidifies when I'm fearful. The blunt and ragged edges of cuts and tears that I make in the clay cultivate a sense of aliveness for me in this new work. It's only in its infancy, some not dry for firing yet. The trust and sharing the four of us have nurtured in just a few weeks provides a structure of courage for me to verbally share something I still know so little about. I'm delighting at what I see in the studio as beauty and motion unfold all around as I work with confident intention rather than unself, rather than self-consciously. And this summer I visited Pennsylvania with my sisters and the image on the left is from a stone house that my father built for us when I was one and we lived there until I was five. And this is the foundation stone. He and my grandfather and his brother uh, chiseled it out of the quarry and I had never noticed, but at my three-year-old height, there are finger marks in the mortar. And I thought that was spectacular for me to see as how I work in clay. The pieces I'm making feel playful to me. Zoe, Heidi, and Amanda being here have helped quiet my usual self-critic companion. And it has given me permission to add seemingly frivolous things like chartreuse and lavender colored slips to some of the parts. This leaves my heart light and my gut at ease and makes me willing to continue digging. Each day for the past two and a half weeks, I've been making ribs and pelvic parts using different commercial high fire clays and blending some of them with uh, different percentages of local clay. Each will record the flame differently when they fire because of varying iron contents and other parts, uh, things that mainly predominantly iron will change the colors and how the flame hits things or how they accept the flame in the kiln. The parts of the pelvis that have been catching my attention are the hollowed out core, the point of attachment to the spine, the acetabulum, if that's the correct pronunciation, I don't know, but it's the receptor for the top of our femurs. The ball end fits into the acetabulum, which is part of the pelvis.
the broad wide hip bones and the tilt of the pelvis. With the ribs, I'm loving the curve and the fluid line, the length and the way the repairs indicate recovery from damage and breaks. The ribs also create a rhythm and pattern. The visual energy for me while making this work, work is asking what lines do the edges create? What volumes do those lines contain? Where do the depressions intersect the carved cuts? And how do the depths of those depressions draw me in? What kind of thoughts filter through my mind when I enter there? How does the gesture of pushed and torn segments of the material make me feel? I'm asking myself, how can I float the rib cage and pelvis in space? While making these parts, I almost immediately began imagining them becoming an installation in combination with other materials after firing with wood. And I'm thinking just like Heidi had mentioned about using the kiln to fuse some parts together by stacking them without any wadding. I have a lot of ribs. I have almost 100 ribs. Mm -hmm. And um, so I imagine that they can become a conglomerate in the kiln. And uh, I think that after unloading the kiln, it's going to take quite some time for me to figure out how to put these parts together, how I'll want to see them in space. But I really am excited about uh, combining them with other materials. I use the grasses a lot I, in the previous slide, I think. So these are some embedded grasses, but in other parts I use them after the firing <clears throat> as attachments. And so I imagine the grasses are going to play a big role in that installation. And I did uh, make openings that will allow for some to be suspended. I'm imagining some suspended and maybe those suspended parts will collect ribs also in them. I don't know, but I think that it will take a, a bit of oops, sorry, work to um, see what happens after the firing. I'm excited about that part too. Um, and then thank you to Zoe and Amanda and Heidi for being willing to come here and take time away from your own homes and studios to be spending this time with me. It's, it's just such a huge gift. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just, to let, just to let everyone know, I, um, thank you also for Benel hosting us here tonight, Asia coming in when the galleries closed. I appreciate that a lot. Um, and we've decided that we will be unloading the big kiln at some point and um, the work will be outside in the kiln shed and maybe here and there out and about. Um, so if anyone is able to come on the 27th, between noon and three, we're gonna have kind of a kiln unloading. I mean, it will already be unloaded, but if you would like to see the work from the firing, please come. That's my address, but yeah, that's it. Thank you for coming. Oh, thank you.